Hi, I'm David Yu, and I'm Blaine Kettlewell. I'm Tom Chang. And I'm Harrison Liu, and we are all master's students at Columbia University studying electrical engineering. In fulfillment of two classes offered at Columbia, VLSI Design Lab and Advanced Digital VLSI Circuits, we designed and taped out an open source 64 CLB and 6 input lookup table field programmable gate array, or FPGA for short. The majority of the FPGA was designed by hand, but we also used digital synthesis tools to synthesize a couple elements of the design. We'll briefly introduce what an FPGA is and explain the motivations behind our project before diving into some demos. In short, an FPGA is a device that allows you to map software into reconfigurable hardware resources. These resources consist of a routing grid and configurable logic blocks. And these resources will allow hardware acceleration for high performance computation and safety critical applications. By completing this project, we learned about the fundamental architecture of FPGAs, the CAD tools needed to build the circuit and layout, and the software tools needed to simulate and synthesize the applications. Finally, we open sourced the software and hardware for the FPGA so that the academic and hobbyist space can apply what we have learned. Now we'll showcase the functionality of our FPGAs through a series of demos for you today. All right, so we're gonna walk through a, a few demos of increasing in, uh, complexity, but first we're gonna have a pretty straightforward demo just to kind of show the configuration process. It's gonna be of a stopwatch, so all of this will be loaded onto the FPGA, and basically the FPGA is dividing down a much faster clock and uh, doing some computations to go from uh, binary to base 10, and then displaying this information to the four segment display and that's done through a master's communication protocol, a master spy communication protocol. Alright, so I'm just going to navigate into the file location that has our, our script and I'm going to run the stopwatch bitstream. Uh, I'm going to pass basically this bitstream into our configuration tool. So upon doing so, I can go ahead and download the bitstream by pressing B. It, it actually sends down 3,249 words, U8 words, and uh, now I'm going to read them back. You'll see a few failures, potential failures, and those just are cells that don't exist. So as you can see, um, all of these are either in column 0 or column 18. We'll explain the FPGA a little bit uh, in latter parts of the presentation. But uh, basically, this, this is a good bit stream. So now I'm going to release the configuration state. And everything's actually uh, low, active low logic. So I'm going to release it by pressing 1. And then the reset, I'm going to release reset. And now you can see here, we've got a stopwatch that counts from 0 to 15 and then loops back to 0. So it does this infinitely. And if I wanted to, I could press the reset button and it would uh, reset all the state registers back to 0. So when it increments a little bit further, I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate that. So I press reset, goes back to 0. Thanks. So now we're going to transition into a slightly more sophisticated demo. We're going to do a thermocouple demo, um, and I'm going to be passing it off to my partner, Harrison, to do so. All right. Now we move on to the next demonstration, um, which is a digital thermometer. The FPGA will read the temperature um, at the thermocouple, voltage at the thermocouple, rather, and translate that into a temperature reading of between 0 and 31 degrees Celsius. So to do that, we are going to uh, do call troll config with the therm demo bitstream. We are going to download the bitstream, <coughs> verify the bitstream, uh, release the config state, and release the reset state. So here we see that the thermocouple is reading, the thermometer is reading the ambient temperature of 22 degrees Celsius. To see how this actually works, I'm going to put my finger on the thermocouple and the temperature should increase as expected and when I release it, the temperature cools down. And if I were to spray this compressed air can at it, you can see that the temperature drops. And there we have it.
the digital thermometer. So now we're moving on to a more sophisticated demo that does gene sequencing and we're downloading the data from the Pi to the FPGA via SPI protocol. And now we're going to download the bitstream. And now we're going to verify it. And then config state. And then reset. Now we're taking, gonna take a look at the dang sequence. So we know uh, inside a dang sequence is a virus that does not contain a data box, and basically that's what the FPJ is doing, which is uh, going through the entire gene sequence and looking for the data box. And now we let the FPGA to process the uh, gene sequence. And now we could, we could tell there's, the light is not on, which means there's no tether box inside the gene sequence. And let's take a look at the um, E. coli bacteria gene. And let's now the um, the FPGA is going to process the gene sequencing, uh, looking for the tether box in the E. coli bacteria. And we could tell the light turns on. That means the FPGA found the tether box in the uh, gene sequence. About ten thousand gene pairs uh, in the in both bacteria and the virus are being scanned through the FPGA and the information is being processed within a couple of milliseconds. All right, we are going to move on to our last demo um, where the FPGA is going to act as a um, encryption and decryption device. So first we're going to put the encryption bitstream in. And then exit the configuration program. Now we call the troll encrypt program. Uh, we can see that the switches here determine which modes it is in. Right now we are in the encryption mode on the XOR cipher. So let's uh, encode some text. And exit. So we can see that the encrypted text looks like that, which um, has some ASCII characters that are not representable. And then what we can do is we can flip the switch to decrypt using the XOR cipher and run the program again on the encrypted text that we have just seen. And then we can take a look at the results. And we can see that we return Trollstegen FPGA, which is our original encrypted text, uh, unencrypted text. Now we are going to do the rotation cipher using this combination of switches. And we are going to call the troll encrypt program and say uh, this is EE6350 VLSI Design Lab. OK. And then we can examine the encrypted file. And it looks like that. And we can attempt to encrypt it again to show that it will not return the unencrypted data. And look at the file. All right, so we can see that we double encrypted the file. Now, instead, we can flip this switch to decrypt the file and run this again and we can see the file, and we get the original unencrypted file. And that concludes our demos for the Trollstegen FPGA. Before we get into the technical documentation and overview of uh, Trollstegen FPGA, 
we just want to showcase a little bit of the I.O. performance. So here you can see we have a counter generation demo and basically we're taking a 30 megahertz top level clock and dividing it down four times. So you see the divided by two clock, by four, eight, and sixteen. And you can see it all goes from zero, um, one, and two, and so on and so forth in binary. If I actually press re reset, you can see the I.O. goes away. If I release, it immediately comes back. So this is at 30 megahertz. We're going to want to run at uh, the higher frequency now to showcase the, the true capabilities of the I.O. So through inspection, we uh, were able to converge to a maximum operating frequency of 100 megahertz. So you can see here that the first least significant bit is 50 megahertz, and each subsequent frequency is half of that. Um, so our initial goal was to meet a top-level clock frequency of 10 megahertz, and obviously we were able to do much, much better than that at 100 megahertz. And you can see the amplitude, we're still almost getting to 3.3 volts, so that's a high performance of our bi-directional level translators for our I.O. And um, yeah, this is just a pretty high performance FPGA. Uh, it's almost meeting some industrial grade FPGA expectations for I.O. performance. This is the demo board for the FPGA in the center right here, which is made out of four layers and has 50 ohm impedance traces. The whole board is powered by a LDO voltage regulator which receives 5 volts from the Raspberry Pi and outputs 3.3 volts to power the PCB and the FPGA's IOs and additionally 1.2 volts to power the FPGA's internal core. These two are shift registers that configure the seven segment display and LEDs right here. And this is a programmable clock generator for clocking the FPGA and PCB. And the associated 25 megahertz crystal is here. This is a thermal sensor for the PCB for uh, heat protection. And this is a reset, push button reset with Schmidt trigger to clean up the reset assertions. These two are PMOD connectors that allow us to connect various peripheral modules to demonstrate the functionality of our FPGA, as you'll see in the upcoming demos. These four are high-speed SMA connectors for high-speed signals that we want to output. On the back side of the PCB, you'll find PFETs here that power the seven-segment display, NFETs to power the LEDs, and a 40-pin GPIO connector that connects to the Raspberry Pi and allows the FPGA to communicate with the Raspberry Pi. Tom just walked you through the demo board that we designed, which we did in a program called Circuit Maker. And we use Circuit Maker because it is a very interesting take on PCB design. Um, Circuit Maker is by Altium, and unlike other software like Eagle or Diptrace, um, it has a community component to it. So here we see the start page in Circuit Maker, and these are some of the popular PCBs designed by other makers in the community. So we can open up our project, which is Trollstegan FPGA here, um, and this is openly accessible to people um, all across the community, and we can see that there are already 206 views from the Circuit Maker community. And here, this is just a quick look at how it looks in Circuit Maker. So we have the solder side, power plane, ground plane, and component side. And the great thing about this program is it also offers a 3D view, which we can um, you know, flip over in any way that we want and check tolerances and all that kind of stuff. Here we have the schematic of the FPGA. Um, we created this symbol and footprint ourselves based on a standard 52-pin QFN package. And all the other components that you see here in the schematic were just um, their footprints downloaded from Circuit Maker, which has a very good repository of standard footprints. To program our FPGA, we used an open source FPGA CAD tool named BTR, which is made possible through a collaboration of universities and researchers around the world. 
What VTR does is it takes a Verilog description of a digital circuit, like this, of the thermocouple demo that you saw earlier, and also a description of the FPGA architecture, like this, which describes the 8x8 CLB 6 input lookup table architecture of our FPGA. And then it outputs a series of files that describes how the circuit should be placed onto the FPGA. To go into more detail, VTR is comprised of three different tools, ODIN, ABC, and VPR. What ODIN does is it synthesizes the actual Verilog description into a circuit, and I'll show you ODIN running here. And after ODIN synthesizes the circuit, we run ABC, which optimizes the synthesized circuit and packs it into our specific six input lookup table architecture. And this is ABC running. And after we've optimized the synthesized circuit through ABC, we finally run VPR, which is the placement tool that actually places the synthesized circuit into our specified FPGA architecture. So this is what pops up after we run VPR. This is the 64 CLB architecture of our FPGA. And if we allow it to proceed, it'll iterate many times to find the most optimal placement and routing of the digital circuit. And again, this is an example of VP VTR working on the thermocouple demo circuit. So now it has completed, and we can now see the routing that took place inside this architecture. This is the routing that the circuit utilizes. And further, we can see in this example, these blue CLBs are feeding signals into this green CLB, which feeds its output to these red CLBs. So now VPR has successfully placed the circuit onto our architecture. So it turns out there is a, an additional step after running VTR, and that is the translation of the produced placement files into a long binary string that is actually downloaded onto the FPGA. VTR doesn't have the capability to produce this binary file, so we created our own bitstream generator to do so. And here, here we'll run the bitstream generator for you. Uh, and just as a reference, this is the actual code of the bitstream generator. It's written in the Scala language. So let's go ahead and run this. And it's going to take a little while to parse through the placement, routing, and netlist to finally produce the uh, binary file that we're going to feed into the Raspberry Pi. So we just have to do some cleaning here of the formatting of the binary file using a program called two vector file and now we can take a look at the final binary file that's going to be downloaded onto the FPGA. So here it is. And there we go. As Tom described just now, uh, we had to build a tool on top of the VTR flow to generate our bitstream. But before we actually built our chip, we obviously had to define our chip and find a way to actually test it out to make sure that our architecture works. To do so, we employed a new hardware description language called Chisel, which was developed by UC Berkeley. And it is a 
abstraction on top of a, another language called Scala, which itself is based on a version of Java. So what we did was we generated the whole model of the um, FPGA in Chisel, and this is what the top level of the Chisel looks like. Um, here we have all the IOs to the FPGA, and using this here, we assemble the FPGA, and that looks like here. So we generate all these types of blocks, which correspond to connection, switch, and logic blocks. And after we do that, we defined a couple of possible test benches. So what we're going to do for you now is just run one of the test benches, which is the majority function. So to do that, we run a Scala program, which takes the bitstream that was generated and applies that to our chisel model. And we run the chisel model, and we select the top level to run. And this will take a while, because the model that's defined in chisel is very, very large. And to do a majority function in just the CPU would take much, much longer than it would on the actual FPGA. So now we wait. And there we see that the majority function passed on our chisel model. And there we have it. OK, now let's talk about the actual circuit that's in our chip. And here's the top schematic um, of our FPGA. As we can see, this is the um, programming I.O. And here's the GP I.O. And here's the host interface I.O. with the clock tree here and the decoder, the row decoder and the column decoder. And now let's take a look at the core schematic. As you can see, uh, here's the core of the FPGA. Um, it's by tile. We have 64 tiles and four uh, each individual blocks would form one tile, which is CLB, horizontal connection block, and uh, vertical connection block, and one switch block. Now let's take a look at the bidirectional level converter. Um, we designed this based on two papers that has the feature of uh, low contention and high speed. On the left side of the schematic, we could convert, uh, it's the circuit that converts from 1.2 volt up to 3.3 volt and on the right side the circuit would convert the voltage from 3.3 volt down to 1.2 volt the reason we're using this design is on the PCB all the modules and peripherals are running on 3.3 volt and that enable us to interface um, the other circuits on the PCB so now let's take a look at the switch block um, that is a rotten topology, which is one of the most three common uh, switch block design in FPGA. So rotten topology has the highest routability, trading off with some area. Now let's talk about the layout for our FPGA. As we can see, we have uh, ESD protection, protection circuit on the corner. Uh, it's for both the 3.3 and 1.2 supply and on the side is the row decoder that we synthesize using um, digital flow at the bottom there's also a column decoder that's also synthesized and um, here when we zoom in this is one tile of the FPGA um, as we mentioned before, um, our design is mostly hand layout with some part of a synthesized circuit. And on the top and the bottom uh, are the decoupling caps for the uh, chip that for both power domains. With that, we conclude our presentation. We hope we were able to convey the design effort involved in bringing this open source FPGA to fruition. Finally, it's important to capture the amount of fun we had in this process and encourage future students to push the boundaries of VLSI design at Columbia and beyond.